Okay. Today we're talking about lifespan development of the brain and behavior. Come on. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> chapter 7. Uh, next week we'll be covering two chapters, uh, 8 and 9, and then the next week we'll be covering two more chapters again. Okay. The brain contains about... Um, 100 billion neurons and an equal number of glial cells. It's estimated that there may be as million as 100 trillion connections within the brain. While connection genetics uh, play an important role in creating the brilliant creatures that each and every one of us may be, the environment guides the process of development. So if you live in a, in a toxic environment, uh, the development's not going to be very complete. Uh, if you live in a in a good environment, uh, then you can potentially live up to your potential. Uh, the most rapid brain growth is during gestation, of course, uh, while you are in the womb, uh, but it continues to expand markedly through language ac the language acquisition years. So the brain continues to grow uh, an exceptional amount un until you're about three or four years old. At that point, of course, it continues to grow, and it continues to grow very, very rapidly uh, until, you, uh, um, until you are in your 20s. All these connections are being made, and this is one of the reasons why uh, the environment that you live in is so important, because you need an enriched environment, you need curiosity. Um, we're not exactly sure what's going on with people uh, who are who spend a lot of time on the computer, uh, but if they're spending time on the computer learning new things, uh, then that environment is quite enriched, and for that reason, uh, there are a lot of individuals who are, are acquiring a great deal of information and probably expanding their brain a great deal. For an egg to, fer to be fertilized and come to term, everything has to be perfect. There has to be 23 chromosomes in the in the sperm. There have to be 23 chromosomes. In the ova, um, the sperm has to be perfect. It has to be able to swim. Uh, we have just learned uh, how sperms swim. They, they swim in a, with uh, flipping their tail in a corkscrew motion, uh, which, is, which allows them to go relatively s uh, straight. Uh, we thought before, because we were looking at them, uh, all we, we were always looking at them through a microscope, and I, I watched millions of sperm, unfortunately, uh, swim under a microscope. It looks like they're just flapping their tail from side to side. Uh, but the reality is they're flapping it and turning it at the same time. We had never seen a sperm from straight on coming toward us uh, because that's not the way microscopes work. But finally, and it, it's it's only been uh, through the last year that we have watched a, a sperm swimming uh, directly toward us, and we can see that their tail uh, uh, turns in a corkscrew motion. Um, everything has to be perfect. Uh, if, uh, a male will ejaculate uh, anywhere from 40 to 150 uh, million sperm per ejaculation. Uh, and of course, a lot of most of those uh, do not uh, do not survive. They they die somewhere in the uterus. Most of them do not swim through the uh, uh, through the cervix. They have to they have to swim through the cervix. Then they have to go all the way through the uterus and into the fallopian tube, and that's where they find the ova. Uh, if the ova is anywhere else, uh, then uh, it uh, will pr will not uh, uh, impregnate. Uh, you can't. It cannot be impregnated. Um, the trip is about 18 centimeters long uh, from the uh, from the vagina uh, into the uh, uh, through the cervix uh, across the uterus and into the fallopian tube is about 18 centimeters. Uh, sperm can swim about 2.5 uh, centimeters per per uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so it, it, it could take them a, up to two hours to get there. They live for uh, 48 to 72 hours, two to three days uh, is how long they, they can live. Um, a lot of times, well, it really <laughs> all depends. <laughs> all ova are female, and, uh, but sperm are not. Sperm are uh, male and female. Uh, so it is a sperm that determines the gender of the, uh, of the individual uh, uh, 
uh, of the baby of the fetus of the zygote um, and uh, one of the things that we have noted is that uh, if you get impregnated early in your in your ovulation cycle a lot of times this it's the female sperm that wins the race uh, if it's right in the middle of the of the ovulation cycle uh, it's uh, very often a male and at the end is, is once again a, a female uh, most sperm or most sperm most babies that are uh, created uh, most ova that are uh, are impregnated uh, become males as weird as that is uh, but by the time the uh, by the time the fetus is born, uh, it's it's about fifty one percent males. But males don't survive as readily outside or after they they've been born. Uh, so it's it's about fifty one percent males and forty nine percent females being born. And uh, by the by the end of the first year, it has switched. So fifty one percent of uh, the female. Uh, Neonates uh, survive, and 49% of the males. That didn't sound right. By the end of the by the end of the first year, uh, the ratio has gone has flip flopped. Uh, so 51% of the the end of it, of the uh, in, the individuals that survive are female, and 49% are male. Uh, males have a lot of negative things. Uh, a lot of negative things happen to them. Uh, autism is more common. Uh, ADHD is more common uh, among males. Uh, genetic problems are more common in, uh, among genetic uh, among males. The ova have must have at least a full complement of twenty three chromosomes and be in the right position when the sperm reaches it. Uh, it needs to be at the top of the fallopian tube. If it's anywhere along the, the fallopian tube, then a lot of times uh, impregnation will not take place. Uh, it has to implant in the right place. Um, the uterine wall must be ready for implantation. The zygote must implant near the top of the uterus. If it implants near the bottom of the uterus, the probability of a miscarriage is much, much higher. Uh, adequate vascularization must take place between the embryo and the, the uterus. Uh, growth and cell division must take place in a continual and balanced pattern. As soon as the sperm penetrates the ova, the structure becomes a zygote. Uh, within 12 hours, the single cell divides into two cells. Within two weeks, the zygote becomes an embryo and divides into three distinct layers. Uh, so this is the route that it has to travel. And as you can see, that's a pretty long way. That's about 18 centimeters. And uh, this is where this is where it has to uh, take place, right here, and then it swims down. It has to implant on the top of the uh, uterine wall. If it's any lower than that, then they, the, the uh, zygote will probably not survive. The nervous system develops from uh, the outer layer of the three, uh, the three layers, the ectoderm. The ectoderm grows into a flat oval plate. Uh, the cells of the plate do not grow at the same rate, and, and a groove will develop. And as we can see, it's developing, it's developing, and that is the groove. This is a groove right here, and it becomes a tube. And that tube becomes your uh, spinal column, and your brain, well, you know, the end of it becomes your brain. Uh, the groove is known as the primitive streak, and this is what it looks like from the top. This is what it looks like looking at it from another angle. As the cells continue to divide, the groove slowly grows into a neural into the neural tube. Uh, the front of the anterior or anterior portion of the tube divides into three structures that will become the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. By the eighth week of gestation, the fetus has developed all the rudimentary organs in its body. Uh, the brain at this time takes up one half of the fetus's mass. Uh, the brain will continue to grow through the teenage years. Actually, it grows into the twenty into your twenties. Uh, our brains are not ad uh, ad adult uh, until we are in our middle twenties. Uh, so you have to wait that long before you've got an adult brain. Uh, so when does the heart start beating? Uh, the heart starts beating about right here at the eighth week. 
The eighth week uh, is what? That's uh, two months into your, well, it's not two months. It's a little bit earlier than that. But uh, eighth week is um, two, two months into the pregnancy. Nervous system development uh, takes place in six stages. Uh, neurogenesis, the formation of neurons. Cell migration, the movement of neurons uh, to form nerve cell populations. Differentiation, development of distinctive types of neurons. Synaptogenesis, development of synaptic connections as axons and dendrites grow. Neuronal uh, cell death, uh, selective death of neurons. Uh, synapse rearrangement, uh, uh, refinement of synaptic connections. The first stage of nerve system development is known as neurogenesis. This is when the nerve cells are produced. Uh, nerve cells themselves do not divide, uh, but the pre-nerve cells, which are located in the inner layer of the neural tube, do divide and create a closely packed layer of cells called the ventricular zone. And this is uh, the ventricular zone. And th this, this is not human. <laughs> this is like a, an insect of some kind that they're showing you. The cells of the ventricular zone continue to divide and, and give rise to the daughter cells, which also divide. All the body's neurons and glial cells are derived from uh, ventricular mitosis. Neural cells will be completely developed by birth. Each neural structure in the brain will develop at the same time in gestation for all humans. And uh, this is humans, all, all humans on Earth that are alive today are genetically really close to each other. Other animals that uh, are farther down the evolution scale, uh, they, they have, there are a lot of differences. Uh, there are more differences in a group of chimpanzees uh, one group living on one side of the mountain and another group living on the other side of the mountain. There's more genetic uh, differentiation between those two groups than there are in all humanity. Uh, so we are really, really close to each other. All humans are very, very similar to each other. Now the problem that we have is that we're not really looking at, uh, when, we, when we look at somebody else and we say, hey, that guy uh, he looks a lot different than I do. I, we're nothing alike. And the, but the reality is, genetically, of course, you are. Um, but if you, but the problem is that when we look at somebody and say, "Hey, you're different from from me," uh, what you're seeing is is superficial things like skin tone, uh, texture of hair. You know, these are all extremely superficial. Uh, you, everybody's got hair in the same places. Everybody's got their eyes in the same place. Everybody's nose is is within a couple centimeters of one another. You know, our, our, our lips are the same. We're, we're almost like twins. Uh, if, if an alien came down from outer space, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between, between one human and another. They would just see, uh, the, you know, the skin tone wouldn't really mean anything to them. It would be like seeing uh, uh, two puppies born out of the same, uh, uh, two puppies born out of the same litter and one, one's black and one's white. You know they wouldn't even see that. We don't. We don't even know that. We know. We know that they're brother and sister, and the fact that their fur is a different color doesn't mean anything, at all. So unfortunately, uh, a lot of what we uh, assume is uh, is these vast differences between one human and another is is nothing at all. Is hardly anything at all. Uh, it's like the difference between a red Angus and a black Angus cow. What's the difference? Uh, not just their fur. That's about it. Um, what are we talking about? Okay, gestational humans. Uh, did I even read this page? Cells of ventricular. No, I didn't. Uh, the cells of the ventricular zone uh, continue to divide and give rise to the, their daughter cells. Yeah, by ventricular mitosis. Neural cells will be completely developed by birth. Each neural structure in the brain will develop at the same time. Uh, in, uh, I already read all that. Okay, neurons of, of the developing nervous system are always on the move. Uh, during the cell migration stage, the cells of the ventricular uh, layer begin to move where they will end up. In humans and other primates, by birth, all, their, all, all of the neur neuronal cells will have found their way to where they will always be. Some neurons will creep down glial cells, known as radial glial cells. 
Neurons can either move uh, down the glial cells or jump from one to the next. Uh, this migration is guided by various chemicals called cell adhesion molecules. Uh, the cerebrum is, uh, is formed by wave after wave of neurons till the entire cerebral cortex is formed. So if you think of it as it's, it's kind of like uh, 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 putting uh, coats, uh, coats of, uh, of paint on, on a surface. Uh, so the first, you know, you, you paint it one time and it's, it's got a, a certain thickness, then you paint it a second time, it's got, a, it's got those, now it's got two, two thicknesses of paint, and you know, you just, you just keep doing that. And that's the way that uh, the cerebrum is formed by, uh, by all of these waves of, of uh, neuronal growth. And it creates these layer after layer after layer of, uh, of neurons. And we'll see that later on, uh, not in this chapter, but we'll see that later on when we talk about these things. Once the preneuronal cells uh, reach their destination, genes in the cells begin to make the proteins that are required by neurons. Uh, at this point, the neurons begin differentiating into the distinctive neurons of the region that they are in. Most neuronal cells differentiate through induction. They take on the task of all their neighboring cells. Some cells are undifferentiated cells and will differentiate into any cells that they are close to. And these are known as, as stem cells. Uh, stem cells have been extremely, have, have been very controversial. And the reason they've been very controversial is because you've got a, a ton of these guys in your umbilical, uh, in your umbilical cord. So when a baby is born, if they save the cells from their umbilical cord, it's full of stem cells. Now, potentially what you can do with stem cells, uh, not just there, you, you can make stem cells out of a lot of different, uh, a lot of different cells on your body. Uh, so what we had, at, at one point, of course, we couldn't do anything with these guys. We didn't know what to do, but, but through stem cell research, uh, we realized that we can regenerate certain things, certain things that, that, that we couldn't regenerate before. If we, we want to grow, uh, if we want to grow a, uh, a new liver or if we want to grow uh, new spinal tissue, um, Potentially, we have the, the possibility of doing this with stem cells. But uh, in uh, the George Bush administration, and Bush was elected in, in 2000, in the George Bush administration, he decided that that was acting like God. And, he and uh, they passed stem cell research uh, uh, appropriations in, the, in Congress. And he vetoed it. He said he said he wouldn't allow that to happen. And since then, of course, uh, the United States has been there has been no stem cell research in the United States. Stem cell research in Canada, stem cell research in, in Holland and in, in Germany, but not in the United States. Uh, so they're making these strides to repair people uh, using stem cells and repair uh, organs that are aren't functioning properly. Uh, potentially diabetes. We haven't really figured the diabetes thing out, uh, but there are a lot of people with spinal spinal cord injuries, TBIs, and, and from TBIs and whatnot, uh, quadriplegics and paraplegics, uh, individuals uh, who uh, are paralyzed uh, because of, of damage to their spinal column. And potentially, we could use these uh, stem cells to repair that, but it's against the law to even work with them in the United States. So as weird as that is. When neurons migrate to their final destination, they start the process of synaptogenesis. Axons and dendrites uh, begin to web out, uh, making contact with the cells that they are going to be responding to. Uh, this is done through swollen ends of dendrites and axons called growth cones. The growth cones reach out uh, using fine filaments, uh, filopodia or plates, uh, lamellopodia, and phyllo means filament, and lamella means plate or sh sheet. Uh, so we have these sheets of, and podia means movement. And so here these things are, are reaching out. Uh, the filaments and the plates are, are reaching out, trying to make connections, or making, actually making connections. Growth cones, cones are drawn by chemical uh, signals called chemoattractants. Uh, growth cones can also be repelled by chemical signals called chemorepellents. As adults, we maintain synaptogenesis structures, dendritic growth cones, exonic, uh, uh, 
chemo attractants and chemo repellents. Uh, synapses can form rapidly on dendrites and dendritic spines. The number of spines increase rapidly after birth and are affected by our experience. And this is one of the reasons why you go to school and you watch the news and you learn new things on a continual basis. You know, it's very important to be taking in new information every day because, uh, because that allows our brain to continue to grow. Uh, and, and of course, that's one of the, um, uh, one of the things that, uh, that colleges are trying to do. They want people to be lifelong learners. Uh, and it's really kind of fun because uh, uh, my parents, <laughs> they, they were really big into education. And of course, my mother had a degree from, uh, she had a nursing degree. And my dad had a banking degree from uh, the University of Wisconsin. My mother had a nursing degree from Ball uh, State University. Uh, so, you know, a lot of this stuff is taking place. And, and they really loved going to these lifelong learner things and learning new, uh, new information. Uh, the the, the uh, professors really love to, to teach in, in those lifelong learning classes because uh, uh, they get a lot of information. Uh, there's a lot of questions being asked. You know, these, uh, these older individuals who've been around for a long time, and they, they get a lot of good information that professors do about some of the experiences that these people have been through. Neuronal cell death, uh, or apoptosis, is uh, crucial to brain development, especially during the embryonic stages. Neuronal cell death ranges from 20 to 80 percent, varying from region to region of the brain and the spinal cord. Now, we need some of these cells to, to kill themselves. We need some of these cells to commit suicide. And the reason is because um, they were necessary uh, in the beginning, and it's, it's like... Uh, uh, it's like creating a, uh, a frame around something to, to, so that you can build it. Uh, once it's built, now it's perfect. All you need to do is take the frame down. And that's exactly what's going on with, with this neuronal cell death. We, we don't need those cells anymore. Uh, when a baby is first born, a baby has the ability to swim. It loses that ability in about six months. Um, a, a baby has the ability to grasp a limb if it needs to. Well, once upon a time, babies, of course, uh, we were tree climbing creatures, and for that reason, those babies needed to be able to. The only way they could survive was by grabbing a hold of things. And of course, at that time, uh, as as we evolved, of course, that's not necessary anymore. Uh, but we still have that capability. Uh, but those th that goes away after about two months. Uh, so you know, some things we need and some things we don't need. Uh, and right now, we don't need to be able to climb trees uh, or to be able to swim uh, at birth. Uh, and for that reason, of course, uh, these things eventually go away. And how do they go away? Well, apoptosis, that part of the brain that tells, pe that tells babies how to swim, uh, that part of the brain will, be, uh, will, will die uh, and, and the baby won't have that capability anymore. Of course, you can teach a baby to swim later on. Uh, and actually, uh, they have taken babies and they have uh, kept them in the water for, for a, a period of time uh, at birth, and they have maintained that region of the brain. It didn't die. It didn't go away. It wasn't uh, gleaned out. An area needs uh, only so many neurons and synapses, and as the area grows, more neurons than are needed flood into the area to ensure that the most perfect neuronal structure and synapse are created. The cells that die are self-selecting uh, to die. They, can, they are committing suicide. All cells carry uh, a death gene that causes a sudden influx and release of calcium ions that causes the mitochondria to release a protein called Diablo. And of course, Diablo is Spanish for the devil. So it's a protein called Diablo. Diablo binds the inhibitors of, of apoptosis proteins, the IAPs, that have been inhibiting a, a family of proteins called cap, uh, caspases. The caspases are proteases or enzymes that dissolve protein. The caspases break down the protein in the DNA of the neuron. Normally, Diablo is inhibited by BCL2, uh, cells that are able to, to make uh, proper and, and adequate synaptic connections are the ones that live, while those that don't 
die rather than make a poor con uh, connection. And of course, we don't want poor connections. We wouldn't be able to function if we had all these poor connections in our bodies. Chemicals that enable proper growth are called neurotropic factors. And of course, that's a joke. Ha 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 ha. Uh, integrating signals hinting at his ob obsolescence, George undergoes ap apoptosis and his brain explodes. As funny as that is. Scientists have discovered a substance that promotes the growth of spinal ganglia that they call nerve growth factor. If a technique could be developed to use nerve, nerve growth factor effectively, spinal injuries could be repaired back to normal function. And of course, we've been working on this for a really long time. Weirdly enough, uh, the, uh, we started doing all of this uh, spinal uh, repair uh, research uh, after Christopher Reeve, the guy that played Superman on the original uh, Superman movie. Well, they're not the original Superman movies. <laughs> Superman movies have been around for a long time. The 1980s, Christopher Reeve uh, was Superman, and he was in a uh, horse riding accident where he fell over. The, the uh, horse uh, balked at jumping a, a, a hurdle, and it, it stopped, uh, and he fell off over the head of the uh, uh, of the horse and landed on his his neck. He land, actually landed on his head and it jammed his neck and it severed his spinal cord. Oh. Well, Christopher Lee Reeve died about uh, five years ago, I guess. Uh, but uh, for the last ten or fifteen years of his life, he was a quadriplegic, and it was after his injury that uh, people started putting money into uh, into uh, spinal column. Uh, injuries and of course we with the IEDs and whatnot in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, we've had some really serious problems with this kind of stuff and uh, we've tried to to cure this but the uh, originally and of course there was there was some research going on before that but people got interested in it because Christopher Reeve had had a, a spinal column injury and of course he promoted that and and he was a famous actor and everybody wanted Christopher Reeve to to walk again, but of course he never did, and he died about five years ago. Uh, with time and experience, uh, some synapti synapses uh, disengage and other synapses are formed. This process is especially prevalent during cell death in the area, defining the remaining synapses to provide optimum connections. While neurons and glial cells uh, develop from the same source uh, cells, uh, scientists don't know what informs the cells to end up as one or the other. While neuronal growth takes place almost exclusively before birth, glial cells have their greatest growth uh, surge uh, right after birth and continue to grow throughout life. The glial cells provide myelin for the axons of the neuron. Uh, the myelin protects, feeds, and accelerates the electrical response on the neuron. Myelination allows people to walk with coordination and the brain to, to process information rapidly. And of course, you're processing this information right now, and it is because of the myelination in your brain that you're able to take in this information and remember it. Now, one of the reasons I tell so many stories about, uh, about things is because it helps you remember. Uh, the narrative is interesting, and because the narrative is interesting, it... it, it uh, excites your brain uh, to the extent that uh, epinephrine is being uh, uh, produced. And the epinephrine, of course, um, allows you to remember things better. So potentially you'll remember the stories, and because you remember the stories, you remember ho how this whole process works. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease that affects uh, select individuals. The uh, condition allows the immune system to attack the myelin of the neurons and leave gaps in the structure that slows the neuronal uh, response. And as you can see the, uh, in the picture on the left, the uh, myelin is going away. Who do we know is with multiple sclerosis? Well, we, I, I know a lot of people because I've been around forever. Uh, Annette Funicello, the uh, beach blanket bingo lady, she used to be a, uh, a, Mickey, uh, a mouseketeer. Uh, she, she had multiple sclerosis and died of multiple sclerosis. Um, I can't think of anybody right off the top of my head. Uh, they, they, uh, they lose their ability to move because 
because all of these uh, neurons are shorting out and the, the message isn't getting there uh, and eventually these neurons will die. Uh, when we talk about autoimmune diseases, what we're talking about is the person's immune system uh, going, you know, saying going haywire just doesn't make a lot of sense. Now that we're talking about COVID-19 and COVID-19, uh, we're trying to build an immune response uh, to the this new virus. Uh, immunity uh, or the concept of immunity becomes extremely important because uh, I have I have argued that probably with my 30 years in medicine, uh, I've come in contact with. Uh, with a COVID, and that that COVID has given me uh, immunity from uh, COVID-19. Uh, they call it the novel com uh, COVID-19 because they haven't seen it before, but that doesn't mean that other um, viruses haven't been similar to, to this one. Uh, once upon a time in Germany, when I was in the military, this is in the early this is in 80, 80 through 82. I was there from 79 to 82. And one, one winter, we had a, an outbreak of, of, COVID, of, a, uh, of a coronavirus. It was uh, walking pneumonia. A walking pneumonia is normally caused by a bacteria. It's, a, it's caused by viruses. In this case, it was the, a coronavirus. And because of that, I, don't, I think I'm probably immune to COVID-19. And I'm not going to go and... and and visit people who have who have the disease just to find out if I really am immune. That could be fatal because I have underlying conditions. I've had a heart attack, and uh, I don't have a spleen, but um, I lost it in a soccer game back in 1985. But uh, it's you know, the, so immunity is really important. Immunity has to do with you not catching a cold this year, you not getting the flu this year, uh, you not, uh, uh, you know, if if uh, meningitis is in the area, you not getting uh, meningitis. Uh, just a ton of different things, you know, fighting off uh, bacterial infections and whatnot, and that's immunity. Uh, it turns out that there are a lot of people who whose immune system. Uh, kind of um, uh, goes haywire and it, it starts attacking its own cells. And that's what lupus is. Lupus erythematosus uh, is a disease, is an autoimmune disease, as is arthritis. Arthritis, your, your joints, uh, the cells in your joint uh, become swollen. And the reason they're swollen is because they're being attacked by your immune system. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why if you ever watch these commercials on television, you know, they talk about Humira. Humira is an, is, uh, um, slows down the immune response. And it, since it's an autoimmune disease, it's trying to keep your own body from attacking your, your cells. Now, the reality is most of us don't have autoimmune disease. Psoriasis is an autoimmune disease. Uh, our, some arthritis is, are autoimmune diseases. Lupus is an autoimmune disease. And multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about this more uh, this is kind of what I was dealing with when I was uh, when I was working in medicine, was immunity and how it works. Intrinsic factors in the development of the nervous system deal with genetic uh, factors that allow for proper development. Uh, when genetic aberrations occur, it can cause abnormal brain structure uh, development. Uh, Tay-Sachs disease causes a destruction of neurons that eventually results in death. It has been identified as a flaw in the 15th chromosome. Tay-Sachs disease is probably something you guys certainly don't need to, to worry about. Tay-Sachs disease uh, is a genetic uh, mutation that has that took place uh, in a select population. That select population were the uh, Anasazi Jews. Uh, the Anasazi, this is the the people of Jewish faith. I know faith, you know, oh great, I go to the wrong church and I get a disease. That's not the way it works. Um, uh, the uh, the Jewish faith uh, wants uh, people to be Jewish. <laughs> they want the pe their own people to be Jewish. So there's a lot of intermarriage taking place. Uh, now sometimes, one of the things that happened, uh, a lot of times uh, Jewish people were isolated uh, and they were forced to... You know, small groups of, of, of Jewish people weren't allowed to go anyplace, and they were in a village, 
and they had to stay there for generation after generation after generation. And one of the things, and this was in, in Eastern Europe, the Anasazis, that's what the Anasazi Jews are, are, are Eastern European Jews. Um, and, and this had to do with, with I, I know that religion just drives me crazy because there's all these odd things that are taking place. Anyway, the, uh, at one point, uh, the Christian church decided that uh, the Jews had killed Jesus. And because of that, they started picking on uh, Jewish populations, driving them out of here and, and forcing them there and putting them in ghettos and, you know, not allowing them to move and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, anyway, they developed this autoimmune disease, this Tay-Sachs disease, which is a mutation of the protein. And the protein starts to break down. And since the protein breaks down, uh, the baby is born normal. Uh, but then the, um, uh, as, the, as the baby should be developing uh, uh, the ability to speak and the ability to move, uh, these proteins are breaking down in their brain and their, their nervous system is breaking down. And they usually die within uh, a year to, to a year and a half, as sad as that all is. This has to do with a flaw in the 15th chromosome, as it says here. Uh, so Tay-Sachs disease is not a disease that you have to worry about. It's just one that we know about and we, we know where it comes from. It's, on the, it's a flaw in the 15th chromosome. This is the mutations that, that, uh, that we uh, will talk about. Down syndrome causes intellectual disability and body, body abnormalities. It has been identified as an extra chromosome on the 21st pair. And of course, we'll talk about that as well. It's trisomy 21. There's three chromosomes, and there should be uh, two. Extrinsic factors include uh, malnutrition, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, hypoxia-induced intellectual disability. The hypoxia takes place at birth. Uh, when the baby's being born, of course, it's getting its uh, air supply. It's getting its oxygen from the umbilical cord. Uh, and as soon as it comes out, it starts breathing air. Uh, there, so there has to be a transfer of uh, hemoglobin. The hemoglobin that it's using inside the womb is fetal hemoglobin, and when it comes out, it has to have an, enough adult hemoglobin to be able to breathe. Well, sometimes the uh, umbilical cord gets pinched off as the baby is being born, if, if it's a difficult uh, pregnancy. And this is one of the reasons why, the, uh, why doctors don't want to leave the baby in the birth canal for, for very long. They need to get the baby out, so they'll use forceps uh, try, trying to get the baby out in order to save the baby, of course and to, to pre prevent hypoxia, but sometimes it happens anyway. Uh, I had a neighbor when I was uh, growing up whose uh, baby was born, and uh, she had, uh, the baby had swallowed uh, fe uh, fecal material, uh, and it had it choked on the fecal material. Uh, as it was being born, it was the mother's feces. Uh, she was uh, obese, the, the mother was obese, and because of that, uh, hypoxia occurred and the baby had a, an intellectual uh, disability. That's sad as all this is. And these are, these are of course, are things that uh, we, we can fight against. Malnutrition, you know, uh, we try to give uh, mothers as much uh, food and, uh, you know, proper food. They need to drink milk and all, the, you know, they need to take their vitamins. And this is one of the reasons why we do this is so malnutrition won't take place, but of course there are always people that uh, they have other priorities, like my my great great my great niece. Uh, she's only one great. Okay, <laughs> my my nephew is my great great nephew. Okay, she gave birth to my great great nephew. She was a she was a um, a heroin addict, and uh, so eating was not her the most important thing to her, uh, and she smoked. Uh, smoking uh, tobacco is a vasoconstrictor. It squeezes it. It closes the blood vessels. And because of that, because she smoked and because she was a heroin addict, she really didn't take care of herself during her pregnancy. And the baby was born uh, not only as a heroin addict, but also as uh, malnourished. Um, now, women who are meth heads, who are, who are on crystal meth, a lot of times, you know, crystal meth just... Uh, uh, Eating is not the most important thing to people. Uh, it's it's the methamphetamines, and of course, if somebody drinks during pregnancy, uh, that will cause uh, a real serious problem with the uh, with the fetus as well. But some of the intrinsic factors are referred to as the genotype. The genotype uh, 
plus the extrinsic factors uh, represent an individual's phenotype. Phenotype means what we see. Genotype is what is inside. Uh, some of the hidden factors are the gen genotype. The, uh, the visible factors are phenotype, and we're going to talk about fetal alcohol syndrome in just a minute. When mutations take place in a species' genetic history, uh, the mutation most often creates a maladaptive uh, circumstance, like the Tay-Sachs disease. It's a mutation of, uh, on the 15th chromosome. Uh, that mutation has caused a flaw in the protein. The protein breaks down after the baby is born, and the baby's uh, uh, nervous system is destroyed and the baby dies. Well, that's a maladaptive circumstance. They don't certainly don't aren't able to reproduce. But on the rare occasion when the mutation is actually useful to the species, the mutation will be reproduced uh, in the offspring. This is what happened. You know, there are a lot of things that are mutations. Mutations, you know, flare up from time to time. Sometimes uh, they're important and sometimes they're not important. A mutation that happened about 10,000 years ago was blue eyes. Uh, what's the difference between somebody with blue eyes and somebody with brown eyes? Uh, somebody with blue eyes uh, can see better in the dark. Um, does that mean anything? Well, uh, probably not. Uh, somebody with brown eyes uh, can see better in the sunlight. Uh, a little bit, not, not a whole lot, not enough to make it that much of a difference. Uh, so why are blue eyes there? Well, they're just a mutation that occurred, and now we see it uh, uh, replicated over and over and over again. And green eyes and gray eyes, of course, are a... Uh, uh, initially, they were blue eyes, and, and we know that because there are a lot more blue-eyed people than there are green-eyed people or gray-eyed people or hazel-eyed people. I'm not even sure what color hazel eyes are. I think it's it's their eyes that, that look uh, between brown and, and blue blue somewhere. Experience is an important factor in brain development. The human brain is only one fourth its adult size at birth, yet few new neurons are added. The reason for the for the exceptional growth is due to dendrite growth and myelination. Dendrite growth and myelination are induced by experience with the various muscles and the sensory organs of the body. And this is one of the reasons why you need to talk to your baby. You need to play with your baby. Uh, what you're doing is you're giving them experience and the babies, of course. You need to allow your baby to, to build, you know, towers or whatever they do with their blocks. You need to let them crawl. Uh, we were watching a baby today. Uh, my grandson had a soccer game, and there was a there was a little I don't know how old the kid could walk, uh, and he kept trying to escape. And this is a great thing for the baby. You know, where in the world did he get the idea to try to run up the hill uh, and escape into onto the parking lot? Uh, but uh, he did. You know, where he kept trying to do it. Of course, we there were people watching him, and they caught him every time. And and everybody else is going. Oh, we got to watch the baby. Yeah, and they do need to watch the baby. That one. That wasn't the what we were laughing at. What we were laughing at was the fact that the, this kid had the idea that he needed to escape. And uh, of course, it's good for him. It's good for him to experience things, uh, to try to run away, to to try to to do things on his own. Of course. And of course, if he had been hit by a car, that would have been a a, a horrible tragedy. But. <clears throat> of course, the idea, that, the fact that he has this idea, something is going on in his in his uh, in his toddler brain that he he needs to toddle off in this direction, away from his his handlers, was a, a really good uh, a good thing for the baby's brain growth. One form of extrin extrinsic uh, extrinsic stimulation causing uh, a problem is amblyopia. Also called walleye and lazy eye, children with the problem have a misalignment of the balance of their binocular vision. And this is usually because the baby always sleeps on that side. So they've got one eye that, that is looking out and the other eye is, is not doing anything. Uh, if the baby normally lies, lays down on its uh, left side, then its left eye is being covered up. And if this is too extensive, uh, then, uh, then uh, the baby is going to have a really serious problem. My niece, I, I, I know I keep talking about my, my relatives like they're all idiots, but uh, I have a, a niece that uh, when she uh, put her baby down, 
Uh, she would put her baby down in front of the television and she would lay her down on her side and she'd put a bottle in front of her and the baby would drink the bottle and watch television. Well, one side of the baby's head was, wasn't getting any stimulation and the other side was getting a lot of stimulation. Well, what happened? Well, the baby developed a uh, lazy eye. This is her oldest child. And she always laid her down in the, exactly the same way because she, it, she laid her down away from the light. She needed, she wanted to sit there and read a magazine or whatever she was doing. And she entertained the baby by letting the baby watch the television set. And the baby developed uh, amblyopia. Well, the baby's in her 30s now. And of course, she has to wear glasses and she had walleye and she hated the patch. Well, let me show you. Uh, okay. This is how they cure amblyopia. They force the bad eye to, uh, or the weak eye, actually, it's not a bad eye. And they force the weak eye to do all the looking. So what they'll do uh, to, to cure them is to, put the, uh, is to put the patch over their eye for a, a number of hours a day. And of course, being my niece and being, as, I mean, she was goofy enough to lay the kid down on the same side every time and have the kid watch television all this uh, while it was developing. Uh, you know, she she wouldn't make her wear a patch, and now she's got, now she looks like that. Uh, she has walleye. She's a, she has graduated from college, but uh, she's got a flaw. She's got a problem. Okay. Um, if left untreated by age seven or eight, the suppressed eye will totally blind. And of course, she's not totally blind in that eye, uh, but uh, she did a very poor job of rehabilitating her her weak eye and and now she has this problem almost uh, fairly severely while treatment in childhood will result in perfect vision uh, when the problem is corrected in adulthood the eye does not gain acute vision and that's what's happened with her by the time she uh, they were her her kids were all pretty spoiled and this one was as spoiled as everybody else uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, they didn't force her to, uh, to, try, to try to correct the problem. And because of that, and because they wouldn't, uh, the child, of course, now has poor vision in her, it's in her left, it's in her right eye. <clears throat> this is because when the problem is allowed to remain the same over time, the neural connections in the brain from the weak eye are not as intricate. And of course, that is the, the basic problem. Understanding of uh, amblyopia and other asymmetrical, symmetrically balanced neural connections has been studied by performing binocular deprivation research on laboratory animals. As sad as that is, uh, they use cats a lot. Uh, when they or when they first started doing this, they cat, capture a feral cat and they would cover one of one of its eyes with something. And of course, the cat would try to get it off. They wouldn't be able to get it off. And eventually, of course, the cat would develop uh, would develop amblyopia. And then that's how they figured it out. Researchers have discovered uh, that sensory organs have a sensitive period when the neural development is crucial for stimulation to induce proper dendritic connections. If stimulation does not occur by this time, recovery uh, to a normal state is impossible. And of course, that's we've seen this with language. Uh, individuals that don't learn to speak uh, any language uh, will have a really hard time learning uh, uh, to speak at all. Uh, if they don't uh, reach that by 12 or, or 13 years old. To understand why people tend to have dominant eyes, it must be remembered that each eye represents millions of receptors vying for attention in the brain. When one eye receives more stimulation than the other, some of the synapses in the brain connected to the unstimulated eye become weaker. While most synapses do not fluctuate in their strength with stimulation, some of them do, and the ones that do are known as Hebbian synapses. Uh, the ones that uh, fluctuate uh, their strength with uh, experience, with stimulation. 75 years ago, the leading cause of intellectual disability in the United States was phenylketonuria, also known as PKU. Uh, you may know this uh, abbreviation if you have children, uh, because they drew a PKU on your baby right after the baby was born. Uh, the, they need to do the PKU within the first week. Uh, to determine. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the baby may suffer from intellectual disability. 
all, almost all states do this. Uh, they run a PKU test on the baby when they are first born. I have lived in Mississippi, uh, Iowa, Nebraska, Indiana. I, my kids were born in Indiana, uh, Texas, California, uh, Montana. All those states have uh, PKU tests. Uh, and this is something that happens um, right after the baby is born. And if they don't do it and the baby uh, eats uh, um, protein, milk, the first after the first milk dosage, uh, they'll get a, get a buildup of this phenylalanine, which is a, uh, it's a waste product. And it will break down, or it, it's a, yeah, anyway, they, they get a break. Phenyl, a phenylketonuria is the waste product, and it's breaking down the phenylalanine in the brain in order to, to create protein. So it breaks the protein down, uh, and the phenylketonuria is produced. The phenylketonuria is a waste product that has to be uh, destroyed. Um... It has to be taken care of. We almost everybody ha take, does this. It's a very small proportion of the population. But if you have a baby that uh, had a, has phenylketonuria or has a possibility of this, they have to stay away from phenylalanine the rest of their lives. And of course, you can put them on a diet that, that takes care of that. About 2% of the population carries the recessive gene. Um, luckily uh, for uh, natives uh, and for African Americans, and for uh, Hispanic people, uh, it is uh, primarily in the white population. The gene controls the enzyme that breaks down uh, phenylalanine and amino acid in uh, protein. Because the enzyme does not break down the phenylalanine, a toxic level collects in the brain and it destroys brain cells. And this, is, this was a major cause of, of, mental, uh, uh, of uh, intellectual disability once upon a time. I almost said mental retardation. We don't use that term anymore. Um, okay, so that's that's PKU. And, of course, I used to draw these. Uh, uh, you have to draw a blood specimen. But you, you have to wait until the, the baby has had, a, uh, uh, has had its first meal. Usually that's milk. It could be either be mother's milk or it could be a, a formula. But it, it uh, has to have its first meal so that you can see if they have a, an overabundance of PKU. There are other... Other tests that we do, we do a thyroid test. We also do a, what they call a maple syrup test. Maple syrup test, uh, it has to do with another, uh, another genetic flaw that causes, uh, can cause intellectual disability. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, or, or it's not funny, I don't know. Anyway, if the, if the baby has this genetic flaw, its urine smells like uh, maple syrup. Uh, of course, you don't go around sniffing diapers. Uh, but uh, one time, I was drawing blood from uh, from a baby, and I and I smelled maple syrup, and I I said, "Well, who's eating pancakes?" And of course, the nurses just they don't eat they don't eat when they're not supposed to. You know, they only eat downstairs. They don't eat up in the nursery. That's I was insulting them. But uh, I said I smell maple syrup, and of course, they started inspecting, and we drew. A maple syrup on the baby that uh, who I was drawing blood from. Uh, we, I drew extra blood, and uh, it turned out that they had this ma maple syrup disease. As weird as that is, the nurses didn't notice. Uh, I don't know. You know, not. Uh, I guess they they think that all urine smells the same. Anyway, they didn't notice. I did. Of course, I, I came from outside. Of course, you have to scrub up when you go into the nursery. Uh, so you got all these, you know, you're scrubbing up with, with all this really strong soap and 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 whatnot. So you got all that smell in your in your in your nose. It's all over the nursery, uh, and somehow I detected the maple syrup, and they they didn't. I guess they were used to it. Anyway. Happy, happy ending. <laughs> William syndrome is a relatively rare genetic abnormality that causes neural and facial abnormalities as well as mild intellectual disability. Research indicates that William syndrome is caused by an incomplete chromosomal structure on the seventh chromosome. So we've talked about the 15th chromosome, we've talked about the 21st chromosome, now we're talking about the seventh chromosome. These individuals have normal linguistic ability but difficulty in learning by observing.
Individuals with Williams syndrome have very characteristic facial features, uh, broad foreheads, small eye openings, low nasal bridge, nostrils that point forward, long area between the nose and the upper lip, full cheeks, large downturned mouth. Uh, this is a baby with, uh, with Williams syndrome on the left, and this is a normal baby. This is a baby without Williams syndrome. As you can see, the cerebellum is much, much larger in this baby than in this baby. Everything else looks about the same. Well, anyway. Uh, so look at this baby. Look at look at this kid. Look at see how he, he looks. And look at these people. They could be they could all be his sisters. As interesting as that is. Okay. Anyway, genetic disorder of the nervous system. Uh, they learn music. Uh, you know, very, very well. They're, they seem to always be smiling, not this one, but everybody else. Okay. Down syndrome is a condition caused by the uh, addition of an extra chromosome among the 21st pair of chromosomes. I'll show you what it looks like. There you go, three of them. You can see these. the 21st chromosome is not very large. It's not a very large chromosome. Uh, 20, where's the 23rd pair? They don't have the... Yes, it is. This is the twenty-third pair right here. This is the the. This is what determines the gender. This is a little girl. She's got uh, Down syndrome. She's got three chromosomes on the twenty-first pair. Uh, this abnormality uh, can cause mild to severe intellectual disability and various physical anomalies, heart malformations, and brittle arteries uh, that lead to a shortened life expectancy. And this is what a baby with Down syndrome looks like. Uh, their tongues are large, um, and they have that uh, extra layer of, of fat underneath their eyelids. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay, they got that extra layer of fat. It's called a, this is called your epicanthic fold, and they have uh, an extra layer of fat. Now, my sister had that. As weird as that is, she wasn't Down syndrome certainly, but uh, uh, she looked more. More Asian, more Oriental, I guess. I guess we're not using that term anymore. Uh, the most frequent form of inherited intellectual disability today is fragile X uh, syndrome. Uh, the DNA of the select chromosome seems more pinched and fragile, uh, more likely to break off. Uh, this is the fragile X. This is a little girl. She's got uh, two X chromosomes. Uh, and as you can see, the X chromosome is fragile. Uh, this occurs in... Uh, the has to occur in the female. It comes from the ova. Uh, it can't come from the, the sperm. Um, because we see it in males. So, uh, and it's, it's about 50-50. So it's usually the, the mother that is, is uh, giving the individual the, uh, their X chromosome. The real problem seems to be an excessively repeated trinucleotide that is in abundance uh, four times normal, thus causing the extended appearance of the chromosome. And these are the symptoms of, uh, this is a family with two kids with uh, fragile X. Uh, their structure is normal. Uh, they have broad foreheads, elongated faces, large prominent ears, strabismus, their eyes are cro uh, crossed, uh, they have highly arched palate, they have hyperextensible uh, joints, and they come out of joint a lot. Uh, hand calluses from self-abuse where they rub their hands. Uh, pectus excavatum uh, is an indented chest. Uh, mitral valve prolapse, uh, they have heart conditions. Uh, they have enlarged testicles if they're a male, of course. Uh, hypotonia, they have low muscle tone. Soft flesh skin, soft fleshy skin, flat feet, and they about 10% have seizures. Uh, and that's what they look like. Uh, that's what they look like. They have low, their ears are low on their heads. They have high foreheads. As, as interesting as that is. Anyway, as you can see, they have high foreheads. About 40% of children born to alcoholic mothers show a distinctive profile of anatomical, physiological, and behavioral impairments known as fetal alcohol syndrome. And I want you to look at this brain. This is a normal baby's brain. This is a baby born uh, with FAS. As you can see, it's not as large, for one thing. 
but it, it's uh, uh, convolutions are there is a lot less extensive. There are other problems that this baby will have, and I will show them to you in just a second. Uh, the children suffering from uh, fetal alcohol syndrome show stunted growth and select facial uh, anomalies. Uh, their brain, as we saw, is smaller than a normal brain. Uh, small eye sockets, flat midface, uh, indistinct philtrum. The philtrum is the this uh, area between your lip and your nose. Uh, normally, you have uh, a crease right there, but they don't. Uh, thin upper lip. Uh, small chin, short nose, lowered ears, low nasal bridge, and epicanthic folds on their eyelids. Once again, the epicanthic fold. This is an extra layer of fat in their in their eyelids. Brain impairment is due to their small brain and brain structure problems, like the almost absent corpus callosum. This is a normal baby with, uh, as you can see, this is the uh, connection between the two hemispheres, and as you can see with this fetal alcohol child. Uh, it barely has a corpus callosum at all, and you can also see that the brain is is uh, is uh, more developed in the normal child than it is in the baby with uh, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. The facial structure, as you can see, is very very different as well. <clears throat> uh, reduction of cerebral cortical gyri, and that's what we were talking about before. You can see it here as well. Not nearly as many convolutions. Intellectual disability can be mild to severe, possibly depending on the time during pregnancy and the level of consumption. Uh, if a woman drinks a lot uh, during her pregnancy, she can be almost assured that this is what's going to happen. Uh, if uh, she drinks from time to time, okay, so uh, one of the things that we've noticed with uh, babies that uh, have FAS or FAE um, their mothers drank in a specific drinking pattern. It usually had to do with binge drinking. So in other words, uh, the mother was abstaining uh, pr primarily through the week, and then on the weekends she'd get snockered. Uh, and so she would drink in this binge fashion, uh, and that's what causes the uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. More than anything else, it's the binge drinking. It's a large uh, amount of alcohol that is being taken in uh, for a, a, a prolonged period of time, but it's, uh, uh, it's the binge drinking pattern. Besides intellectual disability, children with FAS uh, also show such neurological abnormalities as hyperactivity, irritability, and tremulousness. Now, if you have a child that doesn't have fetal alcohol syndrome, there's a pro possibility that that child uh, has fetal alcohol effect, which uh, they look normal, they seem normal, but they're hyperactive. And of course, this will be misdiagnosed as ADHD, probably, because one of the things that uh, doctors do not do is ask mothers how much, how much booze are you, are you consuming during your pregnancy. So if she's consuming, uh, if she's consuming uh, some to, to some extent, then potentially the child won't have fetal alcohol syndrome. They will have fetal alcohol effect. As you can see, all of these children have a problem. Now, this is really kind of interesting because this is a picture from Germany. Uh, Germans, especially northern Germans, have blonde hair. And as you can see, of the eight children in this picture, only two of them have blonde hair. The rest of them have uh, uh, black hair. So who in the world in Germany has black hair? Well, um, uh, the Germans like some people and they don't like other they don't like other Germans and they like other blonde-headed people pretty much and this is what Hitler was talking about if you have studied history uh, but one group that they really dislike are a group of people who are uh, called uh, the Romani the uh, what, what used to be called the gypsies and these are all Romani that's why they have black hair most Germans don't have black hair. It's, you rarely run across a German with black hair. It's usually brown or blonde, but uh, even the southern Germans. Northern Germans, of course, are, all, are Lutheran. People in the south are, are Catholic, but uh, okay. Anyway, that's, that's why this, this picture looks like it does. Why there's not more blonde-headed people in here, of course, that would be, that would be showing Germans who had a problem, and this this individual looks uh, 
almost, well, actually, they look more, certainly more normal than this individual or this individual or this individual. Well, anyway, studies also seem to, to indicate that marijuana may have the same effects as alcohol. Uh, of course, with all the propaganda taking place, uh, we need to legalize marijuana. You know, the, that, that idea, <clears throat> there are all these sites that say, oh, it's not true, it's not true. But, of course, we need to do more studies. We need to see more of this stuff. And it looks like, yes, marijuana is not the, not the uh, natural substance that people try to pretend it is and that it won't hurt anybody. Autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong developmental disorder that is characterized by slight to severe social impairment in language. 70% of children with, a, with uh, autism spectrum disorder develop poor language skills, rarely getting beyond monosyllabic syllabic, uh, responses and echolalia. Uh, ASD doesn't have to, be, uh, to correspond with any intellectual deficiency, but the lack of social interaction may impair the diagnosis. Normally, when an individual meets a stranger, they scan their faces for recognition and potentially put this information in their long-term memory. However, individuals with autism show brain scans where they seek no recognition and therefore have a difficult time making new acquaintances. And this is the, an autistic child, someone suffering from autistic spe uh, spectrum disorder. Uh, this is when they see somebody they know. As you can see, their brain's lighting up. This is when they see somebody that they don't know. They're not, they're not making, paying any attention to the stranger at all. And for that reason, uh, it takes a while before you are a face, uh, that you become a face of somebody that they know. This is one of the reasons why if you're working with somebody with, with uh, autistic spectrum disorder, especially a severe case of autistic spectrum disorder, uh, it may take you months before the, the uh, child starts to respond to you, depending on how severe their autism is. Autistic spectrum disorder uh, seems to have something to do with brain organization. Practically, all information is organized differently from a normal control. Uh, ASD seems to affect uh, from one to two children per thousand. It is far more common among male children than female children and seems to run in families. <clears throat> Various areas of the brain show abnormalities among ASD children, including the corpus callosum. Uh, ASD, formerly called Asperger's syndrome, seems to be a less severe form of uh, ASD where the individual does, does not suffer from language deficits but has problems with social interactions. And, of course, if you watched uh, the uh, television show um, uh, Big Bang Theory, um, all of those guys probably potentially could have had ASD. Probably not, not Leonard uh, so much, but probably um, uh, Sheldon had uh, Asperger's syndrome um, and maybe Raj had uh, Asperger's syndrome. As people age, there seems to be a steady decline in brain size. This is so this is going to make me cry. So, I'm 70 years old. So think of me when I, when I talk about these things. <laughs> As people age, there seems to be a steady decline in brain size. If I start crying, just just turn off the uh, turn off the feed. Uh, what are we talking about? Brain size begins as early as the 30s and begins to accelerate after age 45. However, the degree of decline seems to vary from individual to individual, from barely evident to exaggerated. Yet brain expansion seems to continue to occur, as is evidenced by the presence of growth cones in the frontal lobe, even in the oldest individual. So we can keep learning things as we get older. We just have to not ever stop. <laughs> That's what you got to do. As an individual enters their fifth decade, and I've entered my fifth decade 20 years ago, uh, their hippocampal formation begins to shrink. The supertemporal uh, gyrus also loses volume. In fact, most areas of the brain begin to lose volume. So here I am rattling around. I've got my, this little fist-sized brain rattling around in my skull. Over 4 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Oddly, the possibility of developing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease 
increases with age until the age of 85 and then starts to decline for those who have never developed symptoms. And this is one of the reasons why if you've ever talked to somebody who was 90 or 95 years old, they seem to be okay. Um, one of the reasons is because they had never developed uh, Alzheimer's disease and they will probably die fairly lucid. My mother uh, was 97 when she died and she was relatively lucid uh, until the, about the last six months of her life. Uh, and she started having uh, TIAs, those are mini strokes. Um, and she started having those and she slowed down a little bit. And I think that's probably what killed her. She could have lived into her hundreds, uh, except uh, that uh, she, uh, she stopped uh, wanting to do things. And uh, I don't know if that had to do with the TIAs or whatever, or the fact she wasn't getting any stimulation. If she'd been living in a nursing home instead of with my brother, uh, who never talked to her, uh, then possibly uh, she would have... Uh, this wouldn't have been a problem. Alzheimer's disease starts as a as memory loss, but progresses into greater and greater cognitive function decline until the individual can no longer carry on a conversation. Alzheimer's disease is accompanied by marked cortical atrophy, especially in the frontal, temporal, and parietal areas. Uh, the brains of Alzheimer's patients show degeneration of axon terminals and dendrites caused by the buildup of beta amyloid forming senile plaque. Amyloid precursor, precursor protein is bound by two enzymes, beta secretase and presenilin. Uh, if one of these enzymes mutates, amyloid plaque builds up. And this is what amyloid plaque looks like. It looks like a dead space. And that's exactly what it is. Some cells show abnormalities called neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, these are tangles of the neurofilaments that are produced in abundance <coughs> Excuse me. In the presence of uh, the protein tau, another gene mutation may allow Alzheimer's disease. APOE4 is supposed to break down the amyloid plaque, but is less efficient than the APOE2 uh, or the APOE3. So individuals with this uh, type of uh, uh, APO, uh, APOE4, uh, they develop Alzheimer's disease far more readily than these people. With both amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles clogging the former functional neurons of the brain, the basal forebrain nuclei die, and the cells that produce acetylcholine, and the memory function of the brain dies with them. And I'm going to show you two films now. The first one has to do with two individuals uh, that are developing Alzheimer's disease, which is really kind of curious. Uh, and the other one shows you how it happens. So let's look at the first one. There we go. Okay. Well, my memory, I think, is good. I think it's good. But, I mean, I know the telephone numbers and my call and everything else. But sometimes it gets blurry. My memory? I think it's pretty good. But important things I don't seem to remember. If I could, I would be in, out of college. I was in denial about how bad the Alzheimer's was. But I saw it progressing. It was getting worse. He was sleeping more and more. Um, he was he was just like out of it sometimes. My dad was able to do everything, and now he's... He's not, he's able to barely care for himself. William and Harvey are just two of the 5.3 million people in the United States living with Alzheimer's disease, according to the Alzheimer's Association, and a new case is diagnosed every 70 seconds. Alzheimer's disease is what we call a progressive neurodegenerative disease, and that's just a fancy way of saying that cells in the brain or neurons are dying because of the disease process. While no one really knows what causes Alzheimer's, some of the signs include impaired memory, restlessness, language deterioration, emotional apathy, impaired behavior, and confusion. And the family is great. We had two sons and one with a PhD. And I can't remember the other one. 
my father, he used to own a gin mill. Then he went into the butcher shop business, and he also delivered beer and soda around town and people working for him. It was an interesting life. He made it interesting, so did my mother. And they're still both around, too. Now I'm 92 years old. How about that? If memory changes lead to real functional problems, people are not recognizing people that they've known for years, people are forgetting how to get to places they've gone to for years, or people just aren't able to remember things that they used to be able to remember, to the point that it's affecting their ability to live their life, to carry out their daily tasks, that's when it's time to seek the help of a professional. That's, right. that's when Linda decided she needed some assistance. People would come to the house and he would just let them in. Strangers, perfect strangers, he would let into the house. And they would stay for hours. And I would worry that they'd be walking around my house, uh, you know, checking it out for later or possibly taking things. Or I didn't know, he was signing contracts for services that we didn't need. Now Linda takes Harvey to a special day center for Alzheimer's patients where he spends time with his new friend, William, and a dozen other patients. Both men are living more stimulating lives as the day center helps them to adjust to their future. Uh, you notice that uh, a lot more women in that room than there were men. Uh, men don't make it as, men don't live as long as women do. And of course, uh, it's hard to say who <laughs> would develop develop Alzheimer's more readily. Uh, men just don't live as long as women do. Let's watch the next one. If I can get it to work. There we go. <clears throat> the human brain is a remarkable organ. Complex chemical and electrical processes take place within our brains that let us speak, move, see, remember, feel emotions, and make decisions. Inside a normal, healthy brain, billions of cells, called neurons, constantly communicate with one another. They receive messages from each other as electrical charges travel down the axon to the end of the neuron. The electrical charges release chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. The transmitters move across microscopic gaps or synapses between neurons. They bind to receptor sites on the dendrites of the next neuron. This cellular circuitry enables communication within the brain. Healthy neurotransmission is important for the brain to function well. Alzheimer's disease disrupts this intricate interplay. By compromising the ability of neurons to communicate with one another, the disease over time destroys memory and thinking skills. Scientific research has revealed some of the brain changes that take place in Alzheimer's disease. Abnormal structures called beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are classic biological hallmarks of the disease. Plaques form when specific proteins in the neurons' cell membrane are processed differently. Normally, an enzyme called alpha-secretase snips amyloid precursor protein, or APP, releasing a fragment. A second enzyme, gamma-secretase, also snips APP in another place. These released fragments are thought to benefit neurons. In Alzheimer's disease, the first cut is made most often by another enzyme, beta-secretase. That combined with the cut made by gamma secretase, results in the release of short fragments of APP called beta amyloid. When these fragments clump together, they become toxic and interfere with the function of neurons. As more fragments are added, these oligomers increase in size and become insoluble, eventually forming beta amyloid plaques. Neurofibrillary tangles are made when a protein called tau is modified. In normal brain cells, Tau stabilizes structures critical to the cell's internal transport system. Nutrients and other cellular cargo are carried up and down the structures called microtubules to all parts of the neuron. In Alzheimer's disease, abnormal tau separates from the microtubules, causing them to fall apart. 
strands of this tail combine to form tangles inside the neuron, disabling the transport system and destroying the cell. Neurons in certain brain regions disconnect from each other and eventually die, causing memory loss. As these processes continue, the brain shrinks and loses function. We now know a great deal about changes that take place in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, but there is still much to learn. What other changes are taking place in the aging brain and its cells? And what influence do other diseases, genetics, and lifestyle factors have on the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as the brain and body age? Scientific research is helping to unravel the mystery of Alzheimer's and related brain disorders. As we learn more, researchers move ever closer to discovering ways to treat and ultimately prevent this devastating fatal disease. And there you go. A uh, quick story. Uh, well, as you know, I used to work in medicine. One of the things, I was a lab tech. Uh, in the Air Force, uh, lab techs uh, also help uh, pathologists, and one of the things we did was autopsies. So uh, when I was training, uh, of course, I was I was in a smaller facility, and I didn't have to do that uh, later on in my career. But in the beginning of my career, we, I was in a large facility. This was in uh, what was I? Uh, White Pat Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Outside of Dayton, Ohio, it's actually in uh, Osborne. No, that's not right. Uh, anyway, um, it's I'm great. I got Alzheimer's disease. Uh, no, so, uh, so I, I used to help with uh, autopsies, and uh, I worked for a uh, pathologist that always cut the brains out. I know, I know you guys would never do any of this stuff. You know, you're not allowed to touch dead bodies, but. Uh, you know, that's that was my job when I was in the service. Um, and now I wouldn't think of it, but uh, at the time, that's what I did. Uh, so I helped with a, a number of autopsies. And one autopsy that we did, uh, the individual had died of Alzheimer's disease. And I, like I said, the, the uh, pathologist always cut the brain out. And so that was my job, cutting the brain out. Um, and the, we, we had this one patient that was an Alzheimer's patient and most brains come out, you know, they're fairly, uh, they fill the, 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 uh, skull cap, they fill, fill the skull. Uh, but this one, uh, when we cut it out, it was really, it was about the size of your fist. I mean, it was really tiny. This guy had had Alzheimer's disease for an extended length of time and he died. <clears throat> and because he was uh, ex-military, he, we had to do an autopsy, um, and, and that's what that's what it was going on. This is back in the seventies. I don't know if you still have to do that. Anyway, he had a really really tiny brain. It's kind of funny. I was I guess it wasn't that funny because uh, well what the funny part was the fact he was a general uh, and here he had this little bitty tiny brain. But he had had Alzheimer's disease and that makes a huge difference. Uh, and this pathologist would put all these you know put him in a in a jar and put him up on the up on the wall, which is kind of Kind of interesting. Anyway, you guys, like I said, you guys wouldn't do any of this stuff. But like I, but like I said, that was my job. Okay, so that's the end of chapter eight, seven, seven. Uh, next next week we'll do eight and nine. Uh, so I'll see you next week. Uh,